Hello, and welcome to Dining with Death, True Crime Tuesday. I'm someone who has been through a divorce. I was very, very young when I got married, just 17, and after having three kids very quickly, was separated by 24 and divorced a couple of years later. Fortunately, my ex-husband is a decent human being and not someone I ever had to worry about acting crazy or being dangerous. But I would tell you, there are still fears that come as a mother when you get a divorce or you separate from your children's father. You lose control over who your ex brings around your kids. You lose control over the places your ex takes your kids. You lose control over the person your ex marries. You lose control over the things that are said and done around your kids, what they might be exposed to. All of those things are usual and normal issues that every single person who gets a divorce worries about. And then some of you have it even worse. You do have to worry about your kids being safe. You do have to worry about perhaps an abusive ex or co-parent. And you do have to worry about your children having actual harm done to them. For me, if I'm being really honest, if I was in that situation, I've thought about it, not because it's part of my actual life, but because of what I do here. If I had someone who was abusing my kids or exposing them to dangerous things, I don't know. I'm trying not to let my hillbilly ways take over here. So I'll just say that I could perhaps see myself as someone who would do anything and everything in my power to make it stop. I thought a lot about this as I was researching and writing this story. I thought a lot about the role of power in the lives of children that parents play and just how ultimately helpless children are in a lot of ways. And that is why a lot of us are so fiercely protective over kids. We recognize just how utterly helpless they are and they cannot determine their own path or their own destiny and we want to ensure that they're safe. Most of us can only imagine in our worst nightmares what some kids actually live with. My father, who is a juvenile judge, has seen some terrible things over the years in his courtroom and I actually wish the people in today's story would have been dragged into a courtroom like his. This is a story about bad parenting. This is a terrifying story with a tragic end it's a story about conspiracy theories and drug use, and it's a story about parental control. This is the story of the zombie dad, Eldon Gale Samuel. Let's get into it. Nineteen ninety eight. Eldon Samuel Jr. and Tina McCurdy are married in Northern California. The couple has two sons, Eldon Gale Samuel III, born in 1999, and Jonathan, born in 2000. Jonathan is a special needs child. I read some sources that said he was severely autistic and others said he had Down syndrome. So there's definitely some confusion on that point, but he was a child with special needs. Today in our story, we are talking about three men who all have the same name. Eldon Samuel. We have a grandfather who's briefly mentioned. He is Eldon Samuel. The father is Eldon Samuel II and the son is Eldon Samuel III. So I will be referring to the grandfather as senior. I will be referring to the father as junior and I will be referring to the son as Eldon III. The family, which consisted of Junior, Tina, Eldon III, and Jonathan, was living a very standard American life near Modesto, California. Their friends say the family was nice and well-liked in the beginning. Junior was somewhat involved in local politics and even ran for city council in Modesto at one point. Junior got involved because he was unhappy with the growth in Modesto. He felt the city infrastructure was not capable of handling the growth and he was also upset with crime in the area. Junior was one of those people who liked to blame outsiders for the problems that were happening in his city and he had a lot to say about that. When Junior ran for city council, his platform was about running drug users out of town and bringing rent prices down, and he also wanted more funding for police and fire. All those things would become pretty ironic later on. Junior did not win his bid for city council. After he lost the election, Junior began to change. He was angry, and he was one of those people that, like I said, had a tendency to blame everyone else for his problems. Junior and Tina then made the terrible decision to start using drugs, hard drugs, and their lives and the lives of their children naturally took a very negative turn. 
Years earlier, when the children were young, Tina was involved in a serious car accident, and she struggled with health problems, and I'm sure for her the drugs were a way of dealing with her chronic pain. Apparently, Tina had even tried to take her own life at times because of the drug addiction associated with her pain. Junior then became addicted to painkillers as well, and for about a decade, from 2003 to 2013, Junior went from doctor to doctor, obtaining, at last count, around 6,000 different prescriptions for painkillers. It was somewhere between 25 and 30,000 pills just for Junior, and Tina did about the same. So we're looking at like 50 to 60,000 pain pills between the two of them. And of course this caused the family terrible financial problems. They couldn't keep a home. They couldn't keep a roof over their heads. They would go into very low income rental complexes and they couldn't even afford that. So this was a terrible life for Junior and Tina, but think of their poor boys, much worse for them. And then Junior started becoming violent. He started abusing not only Tina, but Eldon III especially. Junior would beat Eldon III on the legs and feet so that it was hard for him to walk, but that the bruises could be covered with pants and shoes. He was intentional and maniacal about it. Eldon started missing a lot of school because of the abuse and his grades started to suffer. Poor little Jonathan, this kid with disabilities, was kind of caught in the crossfire and when Junior would go into his rages, he would break things that were important to Jonathan. Oh, I hate these guys so much, I really do. At one point, Junior poured lighter fluid all over Tina and said he was going to burn her alive. He even ran Tina over with his car when the kids were small. Junior would often tie Tina up for hours at a time, and once, he made Eldon III urinate on his own mother. There are a lot of other instances I found, but I'm not going to go into any more detail. I just wanted to give you a couple examples so you'll see how bad it was, and I'll just leave it at that. There were some neighbors who would hear what was happening in the Samuel household, and one day one of them had heard enough. They got involved, they called the police, and they called CPS. Their determination was to jail Tina for 160 days for neglect and because the neighbor that called it in said they had seen Tina hitting one of the boys. Junior, however, was not taken to jail, which I find absolutely appalling. Now, Tina is no saint in this story, but still. Now, if you've been around addicts, you know that a very common side of chronic drug abuse is paranoia. And often people who are struggling with drugs or mental illness become attracted to conspiracy theories because they feed that paranoia. No one knows exactly when, but Junior started to get really, really into the prepper lifestyle. For my foreign viewers here in the States, you may have them too, but in case you don't, we have people that we refer to as preppers. They are people who are preparing for the end of the world. That's where the word prepper comes from. They build underground fortresses and bomb shelters and they fill their pantries with canned and bottled foods and they collect lots and lots of guns and ammunition. Some preppers believe they're gearing up for a battle with the government, which is something I find so ridiculous. I can't even wrap my head around it. A bunch of gravy seals are not going to fight the US government who could blow their entire existence up with a single push of a button and a drone strike. <laughs> That's one brand of preppers. Another brand of preppers are those that are always preparing for perhaps a poisoning of the water supply or food supply, which is something that I actually think could happen. And I keep a year's worth of food and water on hand. That was actually something I was taught when I was a Mormon. It's something the Mormon church teaches, but I keep food and water because of that. That I think is just smart. And then you have preppers who are preparing for like a nuclear war. They're preparing to go live underground when the bombs fly and then they're going to come out when it's all over and still be alive. <laughs> Any of that ain't me. I am not going to be out here fighting for a Twinkie. If the bombs come, I am just going out and that's okay. <laughs> but anyway, Junior gets really, really into this prepper mentality and becomes obsessed. But his brand of prepper is the most out there variety of prepper. The preppers who truly believe that we are going to experience a zombie apocalypse. Think back to like 2010, the time of this story, when The Walking Dead had just come out and there were like TV shows on TLC and Discovery about how to become a prepper. It was a thing back then. Zombies were a big thing. And Junior got swept up in all of this. 
If you recall, the Mayan calendar said that the world was going to end in 2012, and so that also played into this zombie prepper mentality. Junior started talking to his boys about zombies nonstop. He started teaching the boys how to use knives and how to stab zombies in the head, and then he started teaching the boys how to shoot. Then came the camping trips. These were not like fun family outings. These were like boot camp for children. Junior would take his boys out into the woods and basically put them through his own version of basic training. At one point, Junior was even shooting live ammo over his kids' heads as they crawled through the forest. Just absolutely horrible, awful, unforgivable things. And then after a day of physical training during which the boys were threatened and most definitely in danger, the family would go inside their camper and watch zombie movies all night. Now, don't think that Junior was like working and providing for his family, oh no. Junior spent all day playing zombie video games. He was on state assistance and sometimes he would sell drugs for money, but he couldn't be bothered with a job. People remember Junior walking around town, always kind of out of it, and always with a gun on him. He was always armed at all times. And in California, I do not know how he wasn't arrested for that alone. Here in Utah is the wild, wild west, and you can walk around with 10 guns strapped to you if you want and are a lunatic, and some people do. But in California, you have to have a permit. You have to be registered. So I'm not sure how he got away with that at all. Junior had his family so scared and so trained that he would run drills where he would set off an alarm and then time the family to see how long it would take them to get their essential supplies and be in the camper. And apparently they had it down to less than a minute. So you can imagine, these kids are living in a constant state of terror. Terror that they'll be beaten. Terror that their father is going to go on a rampage and break their things. Terror that their dad is going to beat their mom and terror that their dad's gonna blow this whistle and start timing them, take them into the woods and shoot live ammo over their head. I just, I, I, I don't like this guy. I don't like this guy. It's appalling and it's disgusting and I just want to know why more wasn't done. As you can, I'm sure, imagine, Eldon III did not do well in school. Eldon was considered a weird kid by the other kids. He was always alone. He was always talking about zombies. He was obsessed with knives. You get the picture. He was that kid, and I'm sure his life was awful. He hated school for good reason, and he spent all of his free time playing zombie video games with his dad and shooting guns. Once in a while, Tina would get fed up and leave, but she never took the kids with her, mind you. She left them in that horrible environment. But she'd leave for a while and then come back. I'd like to think for the sake of the kids, but I don't. In 2012, Tina gave up altogether. She abandoned her family, and because she had been previously arrested for child neglect, this maniac, Junior, was given full custody of the kids. You know what I think about that? I think I want an explanation from the judge that oversaw the divorce. I want an explanation from CPS to the guardian ad litem. I want an explanation from the person who ran the parenting class that people are required to take when they get a divorce. I need answers because that is simply unacceptable. And Tina, I'm gonna bite my tongue. After Tina left, out of spite, Junior took the kids out of California and moved, where else? Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Junior had family in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. That's where Senior comes in. He's kind of an in and out grandfather, but I don't get the impression he was around a lot. But why do I say Coeur d'Alene, Idaho like that? Watch my episode about the town on my playlist, Deadly Destinations. It's first off one of the most stunningly, breathtakingly beautiful places you'll ever go. And in the downtown area, there's kind of this cool hippie vibe. It's lots of cute restaurants and bars and a really laid back mountain vibe to the whole place. But unfortunately, like the smaller towns in Washington State and Oregon, there is an inordinately large amount of neo-Nazis and white supremacists and QAnon believers and preppers and just people that you do not want to be around there as well. They're drawn to the location and they're drawn to the kind of Wild West vibe that exists in Coeur d'Alene. And if you listen to true crime stories for any amount of time, you know some very bad things happen in and come out of Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. 
Anthony, Junior's son from a previous relationship, later said that his dad was moving out of California to get off drugs and become a better dad. And I'm sure that's what Anthony wanted to believe about his father, but he's just not correct in those statements. Junior never made any attempt to be a better dad or to get off drugs. Junior was, of course, telling Anthony all of his problems were because of Tina, and that just simply was not the case. So now we've got this totally unhinged maniac taking a handful of Oxy every day, living in this bastion of conspiracy theories and preppers. And on top of that, he's got no money. A charitable organization took Junior and his boys in and even provided them housing because, like I said, there are a lot of great people in Coeur d'Alene and it's a really beautiful and peaceful place. And this is where Senior kind of comes into the picture. He's kind of in and out of the boys' lives, but I just, like I said earlier, I don't think he was around a lot. This charitable organization is called St. Vincent de Paul and they help families in need, which is wonderful. Once the family of three was settled in this house, being paid for by St. Vincent de Paul, Eldon III started having some really serious problems. And this is, of course, to be expected. He's been treated horribly, he lives in terror, and now he's been abandoned by his own mother. Of course, he's going to have behavioral issues. Eldon III became so violent at school that there was talk of disallowing him to attend. And at times, he would outright attack his little brother. This poor kid, Jonathan, I just cannot think too much about Jonathan because, yeah. I read one incident of Eldon stabbing Jonathan with a pencil. He would shoot at the neighbor's pets and kill their chickens. And of course, he was doing terribly in school. Eldon III complained he was too tired to stay awake in school, and he also complained of headaches. When the school nurse examined him, she found the headaches were due to the fact that his teeth were rotting out of his head. This poor kid hadn't even been taught to brush his teeth or take care of himself, and his parents should be ashamed of themselves. Eldon is 14 at this point in time, and he is just struggling on every level, and why someone didn't step in, I will never understand. The school did refer Eldon III to a psychiatrist who wrote him a prescription for Prozac to try and treat his depression, but the medication never had time to take effect. So as poor Eldon III is struggling every day, Junior gets right back to his antics. He's seen wandering in the neighborhood. He's seen talking to no one, walking in circles in his yard. And I guess I'm a Karen because <laughs> if I saw somebody acting like that and I knew they had kids in the house, I'm demanding something be done. I'm that person. I'm fine with that. And then Junior boards up all of the back doors to the house and covers the windows with paper. So the kids are living basically in the dark. Why wasn't something done? But as bad as it had all been, it was about to get much, much worse. March 24th, 2014. On the very same day Eldon III visited the doctor and received his prescription for Prozac, Junior had some kind of a meltdown. Eldon came home from school to find his father in the front yard of the house, firing his pistol. Jonathan was inside the house crying, and the whole thing just is unbelievable. Eldon III then basically drags his father inside the house, telling him he's going to get arrested if he doesn't quit shooting off his gun. For his efforts in trying to help his father, you know, stay out of jail, Junior takes his gun and pistol whips Eldon with it. Junior is insistent on this day that the zombie apocalypse had begun and that the three of them had to pack up and get prepared and head to the hills. Even though Eldon III was still a believer in a lot of his father's teachings, he seemed to have just reached a breaking point. He told his father to go to bed, that he was high, and that he needed to sleep it off. Junior became incensed that his son was basically calling him out on his insane behavior, and he slapped Eldon for a second time. Eldon had finally reached the end. He walked away, grabbed one of his father's 45s, and shot his dad in the stomach. Junior falls to the ground and then starts to belly crawl towards Jonathan's bedroom. As Junior is pulling himself across the dirty floor of the house, Eldon III begins to believe that he has just turned his father into a zombie. Exactly as his father had taught him to do over and over, he neutralized the threat by walking towards his father and shooting him three more times in the head. Junior was dead and he was dead at the hand of his own son. At this point in the story, I'm sure you are, as I am, experiencing feelings of empathy towards Eldon. This poor kid had been raised in an absolutely horrific atmosphere, and although his actions are terrible and shocking, 
We can understand them, right? We can see why he did what he did. But what he does next, this is where it gets really, really tough. 13 year old Jonathan, who's only younger than Eldon by 11 months, is hiding under his bed at this point. This poor kid who has been raised in this unthinkable lifestyle and on top of that has special needs is terrified. He's just heard a physical fight between his father and his brother and he's heard shots fired and now he hears his brother's footsteps coming towards his room. Eldon III yells at his brother to come out from under his bed but Jonathan is frozen in fear. Eldon then lowers the gun and puts it on the floor. He leaves the room and retrieves a shotgun. He points it at his brother under the bed and fires 10 times. 10 times. So this was either a modified shotgun or Eldon had reloaded. I couldn't find details on which, but 10 times. If that wasn't bad enough, Eldon then stabbed his brother over and over before going to get a machete, which he also used on his brother about 50 times. After this was all over with, Eldon III calmly walked to the phone and called 911. Without any emotion, he told the dispatch officer that he had just shot his father and his little brother, and he would be waiting at the house for the police. When the police arrived, Eldon was standing in the front door covered in blood. He was immediately taken into custody, and police went inside to investigate the home. It was a war zone. On top of the bloody crime scene, the house was littered with hundreds, some people say thousands, of pill bottles. It was filthy. The boys were living in squalor. There were bottles and bottles of alcohol, and most of them were empty. The bodies were removed and taken to the coroner. Jonathan's cause of death was loss of blood from the shotgun wounds, so thankfully he was gone before Eldon did the other things to him. Junior's autopsy? Junior was basically just a fleshy sponge filled with drugs. He had six different narcotics in his system at the time of his death, and his liver was barely functioning. Junior had not only Oxy in his system, but three kinds of benzos, along with a muscle relaxer and a level of Ambien that should have rendered him unconscious. The coroner actually wrote a blackout level of Ambien. So basically, Junior was a zombie. He pretty much was a zombie. Eldon III was taken to police headquarters and an initial interview was begun. Right off the bat, the police were pretty stunned. Eldon did not know his phone number. He didn't know the address of the house he'd been living in for eight months. He didn't even know the name of the street it was on. In the interview, Eldon then makes up a story that his father had killed Jonathan and then he killed his father out of revenge but soon he admitted to what he had really done. Eldon said he hated his brother and he was sick of taking care of him. Taking care of him because, I'm pointing out, the mother left the family and let this maniac have custody and his father, you know, this total loser, these two terrible parents had basically dumped this special needs kid on this 14 year old. This 14 year old who's already struggling with so much on his own it is absolutely unforgivable. So of course, Eldon is going to have resentment towards his brother. He's a kid raising a special needs kid that's only 11 months younger than he is. Eldon told the police that his dad had hit him his whole life, but in the days leading up to the murders, the abuse had increased and his father's behavior had become more insane than usual. Eldon then told the police that he also hated his brother because he believes that his brother's disability and special needs drove his mother away. Eldon was just a kid in an incredible amount of pain, pain that was so intense, he admitted to the police that he thought about and fantasized killing his father and his brother for months just so he could be out of the situation and rid of both of them. It's tragic. People in the area were horrified as the story spread and as the details came out day after day as to just what these boys had lived through and it only got worse. The prosecutor that was assigned to Eldon's case told the public that he was going to ask the courts to try and sentence Eldon as an adult. He said the things Eldon said and his actions on that terrible afternoon proved that he was too dangerous for a juvenile facility. And the prosecutor also said that it was not fair to the juveniles who might be locked up for things like stealing a car or breaking into a house to be exposed to someone as violent as Eldon. And I frankly think that's a better argument. 
I don't want my 14 year old neighbor's kid who stole a couple of cars being locked in a cell with a double murderer, a murderer of his own family. They brought Tina in to testify as to the horrific conditions under which the family lived. Well, she didn't live so much, seeing as how she ran away and left her children to be raised by this dangerous idiot, so. But she talked about how bad it was for her and her sons, and I'm not saying it wasn't bad for her, not at all. I'm just saying that I would die before I left my kids in that situation, and that's just the simple truth. In the end, Eldon was sentenced to 20 years to life in an adult facility. By the time he went to trial, he was 16, and the judge felt that was old enough to sentence him as an adult. I've talked about this before. I have issues with this. No, I don't want him in a juvenile facility, but he'd been locked up somewhere for two years waiting for trial, right? Keep him there. Putting him in with adults at 16, I don't like that. That's just how I feel. At his sentencing, Eldon said, I'm not the same person I was two years ago. I feel like a whole new person, but that doesn't excuse what I did. I lost my dad and my brother, Johnny, my own little brother. And now Eldon's going to spend at least two decades locked up out of the crazy atmosphere he was raised in, probably a lot more clear headed than he once was. And in some ways that seems a harsher punishment than prison. We talk about a lot of sad and upsetting things here on Dining with Death. And we talk about how so often the system fails so many people, but stories like this just hit different for me and I'm sure for many of you. This family was on the police radar. They were on CPS radar and they were on their neighbor's radar. And at every turn, these kids were failed. They were failed first and foremost by their parents. And then they were failed by everyone they came into contact with. I'm sure there are a lot of people looking back on their interactions and wondering if they could have done more. So let me answer that. Yes, you could have. It's not about blame. It's about the truth. And the truth is that yes, they could have done more. And the truth is that yes, we can all do more. If you see something you are concerned about, like I've said before, say something do something. You can always explain yourself later on if you're wrong. You can't always forgive yourself later on if you're right and do nothing to help. Thank you for joining me today on Dining with Death. This was a tough story. Hit the like button if you liked the video. Subscribe to the channel if you want to support me. And of course, you can join my Patreon. If you want to donate a couple bucks a month, that helps. The end goal there is to raise money to donate to police departments that have cold case DNA in storage that cannot be tested because there's no money. We want to help with that. You can find me as Dining with Death on Patreon. I'm on TikTok, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook, I'm everywhere. Your support means the world to me. Stay safe, my friends, and be kind to each other. And I'll see you next time on Dining with Death. Bye.